Right out of the gates, here's the order of things from best to worst. Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2, they can be flip-flopped if needed, I go back and forth from time to time. Homecoming, Spider-Man 3, The Amazing Spider-Man, AIDS, B-Movie, Amazing Spider-Man 2. You disagree? That's cool. This is Movie Feuds. Very different Spideys on display. There's Constipation Spider-Man, Axe Hair Gel Spider-Man, and Baby Six Pack Spider-Man. I've been Team Tobes my whole life and that doesn't really change here, although Tom Holland does put in some great work. There's something about Tobey Maguire's patheticness that really speaks to me. He's like the Frodo Beggins of superheroes, a silly looking lovable scamp who's been dealt a raw hand in life. His burden is his great power and responsibility to the ones he loves and the protection of his city. Even though I didn't much care for the taste of Andrew Garfield's sticky webbing in my mouth, who's writing this? I will say he's pretty great when donning the mask. It's his Peter that rubbed me the wrong way. Oh, for fuck's sake. On the Aunt May side of things, we go from a scale ranging from neat to attend Sunday mass with to I wouldn't regret sharing her bed for a night. That second statement applies to both Marissa Tomei and Sally Field. I enjoy all three versions of this character, from the older, wiser incarnations to the younger, hipper one. Each of these first installments features a love story, too. Kirsten Dunst plays the out-of-Peter's-league love interest Mary Jane Watson in 2002's story. Although she's mainly used as a damsel in distress, the chemistry between her and Toby is on point, and you feel sympathetic for this girl next door. Emma Stone puts in a more well-rounded performance as Gwen Stacy, and she's arguably the best part of this movie. I found the exchanges between her and Garfield to be more awkward and clumsy, though, but that's probably what high school kids sound like that are almost 30 years old. Homecoming's relationship between Parker and Laura Harrier's Liz is far more downplayed and reminded me of my high school flings. Because like them, this goes absolutely nowhere. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man carries over Parker's friend Harry Osborn from the comics to pal around with. James Franco handles the role well, showcasing a range of emotions throughout the picture. I don't think Peter had any friends in the Mark Webb version, unless you count his tears as companions, in which case he's never alone. Unlike previous versions, it's rare to see Homecoming Spider-Man by himself. Typically he's with his funny best friend Ned, his aunt, or his AI suit. The villains are an interesting bunch. Let's start with William Defoe, who gives a very polarizing performance as the Green Goblin. Some, like myself, really dig his overly cartoonish tone, while others will dismiss it as cheesy, or my favorite overused term, cringy. 2012's Amazing Spider-Man as the lamest villain of the bunch. Dr. Connors, aka the Lizard. Not only is he a carbon copy personality-wise of Defoe's Goblin, but he has the dumbest bad guy plan of the lot, which is to turn the entire city's population into lizard people. I recently reviewed Homecoming and said that although I am a big Michael Keaton fan, I found the Vulture to be just alright. Got a lot of pushback on that, and I have no idea why. His motivations make sense, and he's certainly better than most of the MCU villains, but there is nothing memorable here outside the great twist in the final act that many did not see coming, including myself. I've seen Keaton as Beetlejuice, Batman, a washed up actor, multiple versions of himself in the same movie. So to say that this is his best performance to date is insulting. Lastly, there's the memorable performance put in by J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson, a character so perfectly captured the next two versions didn't even bother trying. The Daily Bugle crass-talking, hot-headed editor-in-chief goes out of his way to paint our web head in a bad light, ironically hiring the very guy he hates to snap photos for the cover story. Speaking of, let's head there now. What we have here are three origin stories. Oh, hey. this is Adam. Oh, hey, Sharice. Yeah, we started filming uh, like 20 minutes ago. Thanks for showing up. You're lost? Well, what, where are you? Okay, you're on Main Street. Keep going down about three more blocks. You're going to take a left by a GameStop. Yes, a GameStop. I'm pointing this out as a reference point because everybody goes to GameStop still. Yep, once you go past that, uh, go down a little bit further. Um, pick up some Doritos on your way. I'm hungry. Yeah, I don't know why. I, I just saw Homecoming, and for some reason, Doritos and GameStop popped in my head. I gotta go. I gotta do this. Wait a second, Adam. Homecoming isn't an origin story, you lying son of a bitch. You probably didn't even see the film. Calm down, Matt. I've seen it, okay? One or two people are going to have the name Matt that are watching this, and this is going to speak to them on an even deeper level. 
Sure, it doesn't go the same route that the former ones did with the whole spider bite transformation and the killing of Uncle Ben, played by Cliff Robertson originally and Martin Sheen in 2012. We don't see him create the suit or learn how to harness his abilities, and we certainly don't get our three minutes. Three minutes of playtime by Bonesaw! R.I.P. Macho Man Randy Savage. R.I.P. What we do get, however, is a very young and naive Spider-Man who isn't ready to become an Avenger yet. In fact, by the end of the earlier films, those two old-timers are more Spider-Men than Tom Holland ever is in the so-called non-origin story. Homecoming goes out of its way to not be like those other entries, removing almost any trace of Spidey sense and web swinging. Gone are the inventive Spidey cam swinging shots and slow motion precognition. And don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking Homecoming for going a different route, quite the contrary. We saw what happens when you do a carbon copy. That's what The Amazing Spider-Man is. Still, there are plenty of people who like the darker and more somber angle The Amazing films go. Diving into the backstory of Peter's parents and the constant struggle he has living with his emotional baggage and new powers. Sam Raimi had a vision in 2002 when he put Spider-Man on the big screen. It didn't line up with the comics exactly, and the character was not as humorous or light-hearted as originally conceived. There was, however, clear passion and creativity driving this forward. Hearing Uncle Ben's final words and the reaction on Toby's face is perfect. The chase that follows is intense as hell. The story keeps a great pace and juggles multiple threads, from the training montage to the transformation of Osborne into the sinister goblin. It's the definition of an epic film. I'm not going to continue to bash the Amazing Spider-Man movie here. I've done so plenty of times in other feuds. That would just be redundant. To me, it was the same as the live-action Beauty and the Beast. If you're going to do the same thing again, then what the hell is the point? Especially when the thing you are mirroring is so well loved already. I mean, money is obviously a driving factor in retaining the rights of a character you currently own. Spider-Man Homecoming is a really funny comedy. It's a superhero comedy much in the same vein as Deadpool, minus the aggressive unicorn masturbation we've all come to love. In some ways it's a very unique flick, and in others it's extremely generic. The whole John Hughes-style high school shenanigans are incredibly fun. I was smiling through most of the film. Where it fails for me is the actual superhero stuff. It's fine that the stakes are smaller scale. They should be. However, because the story chooses to blow past the Uncle Ben and parent tragedies, I have no idea why Peter insists on being this other dude. The Spider-Man has no real motivations to be himself. He just is. <laughs> I was worried going in there'd be an over-reliance on Stark tech to make Spider-Man, well, Spider-Man. To an extent, this fear became a reality, but thankfully it's short-lived and leads to some fantastic exchanges between Parker and his suits Cortana. His different web abilities range from that's really cool to electric webbing, really? Tony Stark's inclusions take away from Peter's own ability, and the fact that Stark can create basically anything at this point with unlimited resources makes all those other character outfits seem illogical and silly. Why be in a Spider-Man suit at all? Just give him an Iron Man suit. Let him fly around instead of have to use webs. Let him auto-lock onto villains from miles away. It's just... It's just too much. The fighting isn't great in Homecoming either. Really quick exchanges for the most part until a final act night fight on an invisible plane. It's not the easiest scene to watch and I spent most of that time thinking, this is a really unguarded plane that has a lot of really priceless things on it, really important things. You would think that Stark would at least have a couple iron and flying alongside of it. Amazing Spider-Man for some reason thinks its lead is Batman and opts to have him fight mostly at night. The action sequences are easy enough to keep track of, but there is nothing remotely interesting going on. The school battle is the highlight, and I did enjoy the spider web he builds in the sewer to find his prey. Raimi's action is far more frantic and violent, with our hero getting very cut up and bloody by the time the credits roll. The camera moves with ease as Spidey goes from building to building, sometimes in glorious slow motion. Accompanying him is the best score of the three, and one of the best in superhero history. Ranking up there with Donner's Superman and Burton's Batman, which makes sense considering Danny Elfman also did the Cape Crusaders flick. James Horner really phones it in with Mark Webb's picture and Homecoming forgets it had a theme after the great opening score, instead falling back on the Avengers stock music we've heard 16 times over by now. And believe it or not, this is me trying to be less impartial than usual. Clearly it's not working. Let's conclude. I'm glad Marvel and Sony didn't just turn out the same old Spider-Man movie again. We have Sam Raimi's fantastic trilogy to look back on, and we have Mark Webb's two-parter to show us just how bad things can really get. I prefer Raimi's first installment for many reasons. Traditional origin stories are certainly played out, but when they are done right, with clear passion and heart, they can be very powerful and entertaining. 
2017 Spider-Man Homecoming is a simple and refreshing take on the character that is a letdown for me in terms of pure Hollywood magic, but it's a huge victory, separating itself from the overwhelming amount of comic book movie adaptations hitting the screen each and every month still. As always, I'm eager to hear your thoughts. Leave a comment, vote for your winner, and remember, this is more than just reviews. This is Movie Feuds. Hey Victoria, you know the eclair you just engulfed in one bite that was sitting on the snack table? That was mine. Yeah, and now you're just walking away like you don't hear me. What the fuck? Thanks for watching the video. Feel free to check me out on social media platforms for credibility purposes. Intern Sheila should be putting up some graphics for you to digest, I believe. Otherwise, you'll be out on the curb like your mom. Gotta move on. You can also check me out on patreon.com slash adamdoesmovies. Throw me a buck or two if you want. I run this channel alone. It's, a, it's almost a full-time job, honestly. Thanks for your time. Sheila, the graphics, now.